بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد so today we have our guest uh, brother naji who is in the I don't know, you can say oil industry, gas industry, petroleum industry. Um, and so he's the right person to talk about uh, about uh, what's happening with the gas and petroleum industry versus what is going on with the green uh, and going green and uh, where we're trying to, where the reset or the globalization is taking the trying to take the world to the next step and really what are the options and then as we're talking about this i will also be talking about some sayings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this regard and some sayings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard uh the one that i want to start off with maybe uh just to start with the quran you can say is this particular verse in Surah Al-Baqarah in ayah number 36 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discussing about Adam and Shaytan when Allah says فَأَزَلَّهُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ and Shaytan caused them to become, to slip عَنْهَا فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا مِمَّا كَانَ فِي and he caused them to get out of a state in which they were قُلْ نِحْبِتُوا بَعْدُكُمْ لِبَعْدٍ عَدُوا now you all go down your enemies of one another وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَىٰ And for you in the earth is a place to stay. And مَتَاعٌ إِلَىٰ You have some benefits to a certain time. Meaning the world will end. But the other meaning مَتَاعٌ إِلَىٰ Can specifically mean and you will have resources or benefits to a certain time. So meaning the benefits that are or the things that are in the world in terms of benefit, they're not unlimited. Things like oil, for example, they're limited. And you have benefits up to a certain time. Okay. So, meaning, part of, you can say, the philosophical reasoning for the end of the earth is that mankind would have used the earth pretty much to its capacity uh, or abused the earth pretty much to its capacity uh, and that is what is one of the things that will lead to the uh, final day of judgment. Okay. So I just wanted to say that. So Bismillah. Uh, Brother Naji, so tell me what's going on with the oil industry, uh, China and green, green energy. And because, as you know, the famous saying of the Prophet that people will find this treasure and people will fight over it which I'm going to talk about later, but yes, please. <laughs> Could you be a little bit louder? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Good. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah. yeah, so in regards to your discussion, Jazakallah khair for having me again. Um, again, I will first clarify uh, when it comes to the knowledge of deen, then the interpretations of a hadith and things of that nature. Um, I'll revert to your knowledge there. Um, but just speaking to where the oil and gas industry stands, and how it's kind of looked at from the overall geopolitical scheme of things um, and maybe where it could be heading in some of the signs that are happening there. Uh, but uh, uh, to that point, uh, if we um, first start maybe by understanding when it comes to oil and gas, um, it, we're talking resource, right? So when you talk about the resources of nations in particular, these are the means that they use to trade, right? So if a country is known for producing wheat, for example, wheat becomes their currency in a lot of these overall schemes of things. Historically, the background to all currency or the basis to all currency was 
rooted in gold and silver, right? Then came the introduction of the petrodollar, where as humans, we replaced the global backing of currency as being gold and silver, and now uh, oil and uh, hydrocarbons are oftentimes looked at as that um, um, backing. Um, so just with that background in mind, it allows us to kind of see some of the correlations or ways that not necessarily these hadith may be referring to these things as if they're gold, but we as humans are treating them as if they're gold. We treat it exactly the same way as it's the, the gold standard for currency. It's the main um, resource. And in fact, um, even to the point where it doesn't matter if you have any and you can produce it, it's controlled as to how and where it can be sold and to whom it can be sold. Um, and therefore is, is kind of become a, a very controlled uh, precious commodity um, and really global currency for that matter. So just leaving that as kind of the background to this discussion to maybe help understand uh, where some of this is gonna go, inshallah. Okay, okay, Bismillah. So um, yeah, so you know, we're in, we've been using gas, petroleum, and the world is talking about going green, solar, and all that. Um, how do you look at that? The reality is when we start talking and thinking about going green and finding renewable or alternate sources of energy, that is a must. Right? And I don't think even within the global energy sector, specifically within oil and gas companies, you would find anybody disputing that fact. That's an absolute must. However, where technology stands today, there's no way to completely replace oil and gas as the key source to energy. Even when we talk about wind energy, windmills are made with petroleum products. The windmills themselves are made with petroleum products. When you talk about electric vehicles, how are you charging your electric vehicle? You're plugging it into the electricity in your wall. Where is the electricity in your wall coming from? Majority of the cases, it's coming from gas, right? So these alternative sources of energy are very valuable in terms of allowing us to preserve and be more uh, resourceful and useful with the hydrocarbons that we have. However, again, with where technology stands today, it is impossible to replace these technologies, even by the nature of some of these technologies and how they work. Solar panels, to create solar panels, you're using some hydro, uh, some hydrocarbons, some petroleum products. Um, windmills, again, in the blades themselves, they're petroleum products. It's really in far more than people could even imagine it's being used in. Um, but then even just as an energy source, um, these other sources of energy don't have, our technology is not at the point where they can be um, sustaining on their own as it is. So it's great. It needs supplementing. It can't be replaced. So to that point, it's kind of the best metaphor you could look at it is if you know that you have uh, only a few lemons left and you are running really short on lemons, you don't have a, any other source of lemons, but you think that you can find a way to make these lemons last much longer by supplementing those lemons with something else that you may have. So instead of using a whole lemon uh, uh, when you're adding it to your dish, maybe you use only a little bit of that lemon, but you add some other things that gives the same effect as if you used a whole lemon. That's really the state of the industry right now of where we are and where 
we should be he heading by all practical matters. Now, of course, you're going to have lobbyists on both sides that are going to be screaming, no, 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 we we need more oil. We need to use more oil. Stop these uh, 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 renewable sources. And you may have other people saying, stop all oil. It's bad for the environment. Reality is what is actually needed is a much more moderate middle ground approach um, hmm. for the industry to follow. Okay. And so <clears throat> there are a few things that, uh, actually two things, one ayah in Quran and then one saying of the prophet, which is more direct that points to oil and what it will do to the world. So I want you to comment on that. Uh, but before I comment on that, I want to make a point that how do you know if something is to be taken literally? And how do you know if something should be taken metaphorically? So uh, I will give those rules, uh, but let's first look at the tradition of the Prophet that I'm referring to, and then some other verses of the Quran that directly or indirectly have to do with these are a whole bunch of narrations of the prophet وسلم, and by the number of narrations you can probably see that it seems pretty authentic just by the just by looking at the large number of narrations but the prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yushaku furat an yahsira an kanz min adhab that soon Furat, which is Euphrates, will reveal a treasure, a kanz, min al-dhahab, of gold. Now, a side point before I talk about interpretation is that interesting because the petrodollar literally became gold, right? Whoever is present at that time should not take anything from it. And so this leads us to another question that would the Islamic civilization have grown to be what we are today? Had, meaning if we had an Islamic civilization based upon Islamic principles, would civilization have moved in the direction that we moved in uh, after the industrial age? That's, that's a separate question. Now, uh, there's another narration uh, this is similar. And then in another narration, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that soon the Furat, the Euphrates, will reveal a mountain of gold or mountain instead of Jabal of Dahab, which is what you would normally expect the sentence to be. The sentence is Jabal min al Dahab. Instead of a mountain of gold, literally, it's saying mountain from gold, uh, I guess. is. But anyway, this is interesting how the wordings are. In every single narration, it's like this. Uh, a mountain of gold. Whoever is present at that time, let him not take anything from it. Now, there can be different interpretations. So this is why I wanted to talk about different uh, ways of interpreting. One is to take it literally. That Euphrates will uncover itself, and when it uncovers itself, we will find a mountain of gold. This is one interpretation. But how do you know if you're going to give a metaphorical interpretation or if you're going to give a physical uh, interpretation? One way to know that you're going to give a metaphorical interpretation is if it's physically not possible. Like if I said, if you you will find donkeys in the air. Now we know donkeys don't fly. And so therefore you're going to have to give it a metaphorical interpretation. So the Euphrates is at its maximum 180 meters high. At its maximum. So if you have a mountain that is going to be revealed that's 180 feet high, 
that wouldn't create a situation where people are going to go there and fight each other to kill each other. This is one. Second is, second reason why you give something a metaphorical interpretation is that it has been described in more ways than one in a metaphorical way to make sure that it is seen as a metaphor. So meaning some narrations will say a treasure and some narrations will say a mountain, a so treasure of gold versus a mountain of gold. So if it was <clears throat> physical, if if the if if it was physical, then uh the Prophet وسلم, like in, in physic literally will is it still possible that it could be literal? Yes, it, it is still possible. But the wordings of the hadith seem to point to something metaphorical. This is one way to look at it. Now somebody can disagree with me, but it is then with where we are sitting today, meaning where we are sitting today, it is not by chance that when you look at the map of the oil fields, you find that the oil field is exactly along the Euphrates from the beginning to the end. So that also shows that this particular pipeline that's in Iraq uh, now, there's another possible meaning that it could be, which is that uh, water is being stopped by Turkey into Iraq. And therefore, the water will become uncut, meaning there'll be less water, which then gives the water the value of gold. And people, because there'll be no water for irrigation, and that will lead to people fighting each other. But the hadith seems to indicate that it will not just be a local phenomenon, but a uh, a larger, not necessarily global, but larger than just something local. Anyway, with if it is right that the Prophet was referring to something metaphorical, and if it is right, then therefore the Prophet was referring to the oil fields of Iraq which I think is one of the first places oil was discovered in the Middle East, was this Euphrates area. If this is true, how do you see a scenario like this come about? So hard, to, sorry, hard to answer. Yeah, because Iraq has the third most oil in the world. Uh, you have Saudi Arabia that has the largest reserves. Mm -hmm. And then you have Russia. But Russia has a large population or it has its own vendors and large population. China it possibly being its vendors. Um, then Iraq is like one of the main oil fields of the world. So okay. with that in, in mind. One thing too that I will say, and please forget... I, don't mean this in a negative way, but it is, I would caution from personal experiences, I would caution against utilizing published data for oil reserves and the amount of oil produced. I've personally been assigned to projects in countries, I won't say where, where it was projects for BP, British Petroleum, and those countries report zero barrels of oil produced every year. So to that point, following these published numbers is playing, playing into the game. So who's number one, two, three, four? I won't go into that, but we do know that Iraq is one of the most resourceful um countries, mm. particularly for oil. Mm. Russia is more so on the gas side, um, but Iraq, Saudi, uh, Venezuela, Libya, um, pretty much wherever there's major conflict, you'll, you'll oftentimes find they have some major uh, uh, oil and gas reserves in, in, in those kinds of countries. Um, the second thing, too, to say is, you know, 
again, not knowing enough in regards to Dean to know literal versus metaphorical in these circumstances, I will comment to say the big, one big takeaway I can get, which is humorous to me, is how we have, as humans, replaced gold for oil to the point where <coughs> we can have these conversations honestly to say, could something that was that even metaphorically and physically is known to be shiny and beautiful. And if somebody wants to say you are the, you have the best character in the world, they'll say you have a heart of gold, right? We have taken something with such negative connotations, black and ugly, and he's, he's as dirty as oil or whatever it may be. And we have chosen to elevate that to the same level as gold voluntarily as as a uh, uh, as as humankind that's one big takeaway i take from it is is just to kind of laugh and and snicker to say really have we stooped that low i guess we have but uh um, nonetheless one thing so if we're talking about gold or oil we'll be having the same conversation when it comes to mining either gold or oil. Let's say a country comes and finds, wow, we have this huge uh, uh, deposit of gold, or wow, we have these massive reserves of oil. We want to start producing it and selling it to the world so that we can, you know, pull our, ourselves out of poverty. Mm. Not so fast, not the way that the system was created. When the system was created with the petrodollar as the, the core to it, the other root word to petrodollar other than petro is dollar, mm -hmm. right? So it's the US or you can say uh, uh, the governments in, tied into the, this alliance that are in control of the trade of it. So mm -hmm. what happens is, if I get it and I want to sell it, I'll have nowhere to sell it unless I go through the set channels that are there that are going to require me to follow all of their rules politically to uh, 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 ban whatever ideologies some people may have and only follow their ideologies and allow uh, whoever to be whoever they want to be doesn't matter if it is sane or not allow everybody to be whatever they want to be if you don't accept that they won't allow you to sell it mm -hmm. so then people will say okay just go sell it to somebody else well when everybody fears the military prowess of those who control this system nobody is going to turn their backs on this system that allows them to avoid constant bombardment and bombing and whatever it may be. So they're not going to buy it from you. But, and this subhanAllah, you know, kind of a little bit of a circle to our last discussion when we were talking about a polar world. It's mm -hmm. starting to change now, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what is the biggest issue between why are these allies there when they say oh it's iran china and russia and sudan and syria and they add a couple to the list every day um but it's these guys against everybody else right so when you ask well what is the core difference why are they allying there and we are allying against them there has to be a common issue that they're uniting against if they're going to ally on something. And to me, perhaps it's the economic agenda. Mm -hmm. It is these countries saying, wait, 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 we don't want to deal with US dollars. Why is US dollars gonna be the core currency? All that does is ensure the US dollar never loses its value so long as the world hasn't blown itself up, right? right. 
we don't agree with that system. All we're doing is hurting ourselves. So they'll say, okay, off with you, right? Or somebody who says, no, I don't agree with allowing people to do this or do that or whatever because of our beliefs or our ideologies or whatever it may be. Okay, off with you. So these people now have nowhere to trade. And if they can't trade, they're going to be left to die. And as a result of it, they create an alliance, if you must, that's how we refer to it, but really it's just an alternative trade route, right? Mm -hmm. If the US or who, I don't want to say the US, but the system and whoever's in control of the system is going to block you off completely from trading within the entire world outside of a few countries, naturally, you know, fight or flight, you have to survive. You're going to say, okay, knock, knock on whoever those few countries left door are that will actually trade with me. Okay, let's trade now. Hmm. And that is true whether we talk about oil or we talk about gold, right? Hmm. Because those are both, and I say that's where it's funny because we have elevated it to the level. They're both controlled in the exact same way Mm. in terms of the global trade of it, Mm -hmm. right? You can't just go find it and put it on eBay when it comes to these things. Obviously, if you're dealing in small amounts of gold and things, nobody's going to be coming. But if you're saying, you know, you have, you know, thousands of tons of gold in (laughs) reserve, who wants to buy it, you better believe that. And we actually saw some things on the news recently in regards to Russian planes in Sudan taking some gold as well as oil. Sudan was one of the ones who are embargoed by the United States. As a result, they got to trade with somebody. So they're trading with Russia. Of course, it's funny when you hear the media referring it to it as Russian planes stealing gold and oil from Sudan. Most likely it was Sudan saying, well, we got to make some money somewhere. Can't trade this to the U.S. because they won't let us. Hey, Russia, do you want to buy some? Mm. And it's probably a a standard deal, but who knows? But um, without digressing too much, um, uh, the irony of this conversation is you can interchange the word oil or gold gold from our perspective it still has that same outcome. Even if it's there, even if you try to take it, you will not be able to sell it. And if you try to thumb them and say, all right, we already found buyers in China and Russia and whatever, and we're going to, you know, whatever, that's when they will come and who knows how many percentage of the people will die as a result of it. But that's exactly what we saw in Libya. And again, to the yeah. irony of Libya, it was both the oil and the gold. Right. The, 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 the Libya said we want to start dealing only in gold rather than in dollars. But they also had these resourceful reserves in oil. And as soon as they turned their face to that system, look at the situation in Libya. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, again, how leave leave the the literal versus uh, metaphorical uh, aspect away and just look at how we treat resources in general um, and specifically those two resources. And it's a scary uh, uh, future that that beholds these places because the reality is the economy, the global economy is crashing at the same time. Countries who cannot trade their resources freely are going to by, by necessity become more and more and more desperate. Mm -hmm. And further desperation is only going to lead to I mean, I don't even need to say it. We all are logical enough. Every human is logical enough to imagine what that could could lead to, right? Can you also speak to the fact that China basically controls, or maybe control is the wrong word, but uh, 
is the producer of green energy. Oh, they 100% dominate the entire green energy industry because when you think of where technology is right now, and we talk, I'm talking about green energy as a source, we're not talking about electric cars. Electric cars are not sourcing energy. They're utilizing energy in a different way. We're talking about sources of energy. Really, you're talking about wind energy. You're talking about solar energy. And where actually probably there's, from what I'm familiar with, the most promise, but technology just isn't at the level of having been able to uh, uh, go too deep into it, but utilizing water energy, even from things such as the sea, right? Utilizing seawater as means of, of creating energy, um, but that's technology and, and trillions of dollars and lots of R&D years in the future. But nonetheless, where it is now, you're probably talking about wind energy or solar energy of some sort. Wind energy is not a highly, and both, both of these energy sources are not highly <coughs> energies. They don't require operating machinery that must have long life and it has all these intricacies and maybe software components coded in. So you want to make sure that only the best components and the best engineers and everything went involved in it. These are as basic of technologies as one could imagine. You have a windmill, some propellers on, on you know, I think, of course, there's a lot of components and, and things that go into it. I'm not negating that, but less technically advanced than other technologies. Solar panels, they're crystals that are, you know, aligned in a certain way that can take the, the reflection or retract. Don't, I'm not a green energy person, so I'm not trying to give a technical lesson on something I don't know, but it's not a highly advanced technology. It's, you know, a very simple phenomena that you take advantage of, whether you talk about wind or sun. I also so heard that about wind... Uh the wind uh, mills, they're also bad for the environment because they end yeah. up getting burned. And, and as I mentioned, there's petroleum products that are required to be in these windmill blades and things for things like longevity and weather, uh, uh, weathering the elements and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, of course, there's some of that um, aspect to it as well. And Let's be honest, they're a site. They're not a site for solar. They're really hideous. They're not pleasant to look at. Nobody wants to live in an area that's just surrounded by these massive windmill farms. And in fact, I was talking with somebody recently about it, which was quite unique. I never even knew that. But people actually who live near these farms actually oftentimes are developing uh, health issues because the way these windmills, these blades are so large and retracting these uh, very large shadows across large areas, it causes a lot of disorientation and vertigo and nausea and things of that nature. Side notes, uh -oh. I'm not trying to, to speak ill on those so technologies. If China dominates the green energy and the US dominates the system of the petrol mm -hmm. dollar, and we see this kind of like clash between these two, uh, China and the U.S. Why, I guess, would, um, here's, it's it's it just, I'm going to throw it out there, I guess. Uh, would the U.S. be okay with moving forward towards green and giving that extra leverage to China? Or do you think America will resist? Or do you think it's just already planned? I, my personal thought is, even if green energy were to be advanced to its full capacity today, I'm not saying where technology could lead in the future, but if it could be advanced 
to its full capability today, it still would not take a penny out of the pockets of the oil and gas companies mm. because that still will not eliminate the need. It will just make countries and delegations and, and conglomerates like OPEC have to make more calculated strategic decisions about how much they produce at once. But remember, I see what you're saying. The, the, in the world the, of supply the, and demand, it won't, they will still in the end be walking away just as profitable with it as without it, with these technologies. Right. From their perspective for a longer time also, right? Because they're trying to prolong right. the, the usage of oil. And like you but, said, but the one caveat to it, though, that I will say is all of that, that, that's to say it wouldn't take away money from the oil and gas companies, but it still would be putting a ton of money in China's pocket and not the U.S.'s pocket when it comes to those green energies, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's if it's a, hey, we don't want them to get bigger than us, then they would perhaps maybe try to stand in, in, in the way of it. But if it's, we don't want them to take away our dollars, it's not a, it's not a risk when you talk about advancing these technologies today. Um, but it's, uh, at some point or another, we have to take a step back Logically, I'm not talking about all of their policies, but in regards to this, you have to take a step back, look at history, look at the decisions that were made, and look at where it led certain governments and countries today, and you have to applaud what China did at the time that the United States and the rest of the world went pedal to the metal, full throttle towards the oil and gas craze. Mm. What China did was they remained balanced. They went in just like everybody else, but maybe not as fast and as deep and as quickly as everybody else. So they got to learn a lot from other people's mistakes in, pro in the process and save themselves a lot of money in the process. But they also left <coughs> with those doors and avenues open for what if for any reason this technology does not pan out. Mm -hmm. So they, a lot of their uh, uh, factories and buildings are backwards compatible with coal. Mm -hmm. The United States has an abundance of coal. It's a very dirty energy, right? Poor for the environment. But if the world were to run into a circumstance where it's not foreseeable, but we have no other sources, China's ready to go to just backwards compatibly run their equipment and their manufacturing on coal. We would have to go back to the Stone Age and build ourselves back up all over again to mm. even start there. And the same thing goes, that's, that's for looking back. They're saying, okay, if we have to take a step back, let's leave that door. What they also did was look to the future as well oh, to okay. say, if we have to take, if we progress beyond this, where will we go with that? In candor, where the rest of the world is only really recently starting to play into that space of, hmm, what could be after oil and gas, where China's light years above it before everybody else, which is why they can make all of these green technologies far cheaper than anybody else could even dream of making them. Mm. And again, because they're such basic technologies, people don't necessarily care made in China versus made in Germany when it comes to a windmill or a solar panel. So I might as get, well get the one that's the best deal possible. And so, you know, I, I, at this point, I just say, this is the point where as much as the U.S. may look at it and say, uh-oh, they're, they're set up for success, you kind of have to take a step back, applaud it, and say, 
well, they had a better strategy and a better approach from the beginning than we did. And now they're in the phase where they're going to reap the rewards of it because there's no way that we can reverse what reverse history and what's happened till now. So. Hmm. Now, in terms of this, I want to share with you some uh, verses of the Quran and this same saying of the Prophet with some verses of the Quran. And then I want you to make <clears throat> some comments if you see these things tie up together in terms of future events. So I'm going to try to do this quickly, but uh, let's see where I can go with this, inshallah. So we were mentioning the saying of the Prophet وسلم, about not taking this. And many of the traditions of the Prophet say, because over here, for example, the Prophet said, لا تقوم الساعة, The hour will not happen. حتى يحصر الفرات من جبل من ذهب That until the Furat, the Euphrates, reveals a mountain of gold. Okay. <clears throat> and then, فيقتل الناس عليه فيقتل من كل عشرة تسعة that people will fight over this and for every nine, every 10 people, nine will be killed. And then you find these same wordings over and over again in the different sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. This one over here in this narration, the Prophet says, min kulli mi'atin tis'a wa tis'un. Every 99 will be killed out of 100. فَيَقُولُ كُلُّ رَجُلٍ مِّنْهُمْ And every man of them will say لَعَلِّي أَنْ أَكُونَ أَنَا أَنْجَهُ uh, I will be the one that will be the one that will be saved. Okay, so with this context in mind, and since this is the area the Prophet pointed to, uh, and now let me tie this in with some other narrations of the Prophet, I mean, so, uh, some verses of the Qur'an to give like a similar picture, but different perspectives within the Qur'an, right? That something big is going to happen. And it seems like everything will collapse. And as everything is collapsing, it's going to create wars. And everyone's going to go after the resources that they can. So, for example, I was talking about this verse. So the, this verse d seems to divide human history into two parts. The agrarian society, where you eat from the agriculture and you trade in agriculture, and the seasons of the, of, of the world decide basically how the economy is going to run, versus the industrial age, which is the second part. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And the example of this life, of dunya is like water that Allah sends down from the sky and then it mixes with the greenery of the earth from which mankind eats and cattle eat until then a time comes until the earth brings about its ornaments and makes the world beautiful meaning the industrial age came the iron and the ore and the steel and the copper, and especially oil, which is really zuhruf, meaning the ornaments, the, the gold and the silver. Wazuyinat, and it makes that gold and silver makes the world beautiful. ahluha, and the people in charge of the earth, they will say, Annahum qadiruna alayha, we have full control over this earth. When this state reaches, our command will come, one command will come either in the day or the night. We'll make the world as if it was back in Stone Age, for, or as if it had been already, everything had been harvested. As if there was no yesterday. This is how we clarify our verses for people that think. Now, I want you to just keep this in mind with that saying of the Prophet mind that 99 out of 100. And I just want you to add these following verses with that. 
In Surah Al-Isra, Allah says, "Immin qariyatin nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al-qiyamah." There will be no city or no town except we will destroy it before the day of judgment. Aw muadhibuha, or we'll severely punish it, adaban shadida with a severe punishment. Kan adalika fil kitabi masthura. This is written in a book. It's going to happen. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, <clears throat> in ayah number two, "Qayyiman," straight up warning. لِيُنْزِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدٍ To warn you of a severe punishment. And بَأْسًا شَدِيدٍ is also used in Surah Al-Isra and other places in the Qur'an to mean war. To warn you of a great war. مِنْ لَدُنْهُ From him. وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ And to give good, good tidings to the people who even in those difficult times do good deeds. أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا حَسَنًا For them is a Great re reward from Allah. Then going on to the next ayah in Surah Al-Kahf. وَرَبُّكَ الْغَفُورُ ذُو الرَّحْمَةِ And your Rabb is غَفُور. He is merciful and he is forgiving. لَوْ يُؤَاخِذُهُمْ بِمَا كَسَبُوا لَعَجَّ لَهُمُ الْعَذَابِ If Allah was to take them for, the, for what they earned, the punishment would have come in immediately. بَلْ لَهُمْ مَوْعِدٌ But no, there's a time appointed. And no one can change that. This is the verse that I wanted to talk about. These are cities we destroyed when they did wrong. Meaning this is the sunnah of Allah. When So on the one side we have technology going up, which is creating its own havoc. But then we have this kind of like decadency, right, of human beings. Tilka uh, al-qura ahlaknahum lamma zalamu. These were nations that we destroyed or cities we destroyed when they did wrong. And we have written a time for their destruction. So you have political corruption like Fir'aun. You have moral corruption like Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. You have economic corruption like Salih alayhi salatu wasalam. And on and on and on. Okay. <clears throat> so now let me share another near, near, uh, verse of the Quran. This is in Surah Dukhan. In ayah number 10, Allah says, again, the same issue, which is the destruction of humanity by their own hands. So we have the hadith, which is specifically referring to the oil, it seems to me. And then you have these verses that are, the first verse was talking about the two phases of human history and how it will just collapse. Then Allah says, there will be no town except we will destroy it. And then Allah says, I'm warning you of a big warning. And then Allah says, look, we destroy people when they do wrong. And then this now is very, So watch out for that day when the sky will be visibly smoke. What will be that smoke? It will cover mankind. Now, Adabun Alim is used in Quran for punishment in this world and the next, compared to Adabun Alim, which is only for the next. Yakshan Nas, it'll cover the people. This is a very severe punishment. And they will do dua, specifically the Muslims, and to me, it seems the Arab world. Oh Allah, Remove this punishment from us. We now believe. We're going to believe. And Allah then taunts, Anna lahumu dhikra. Did not my message come to you before this? Now that you're turning to Allah. وَقَدْ جَاءُمْ رَسُولٌ مُبِينٌ And a clear messenger came to you telling you that this would happen. ثُمَّ تَوَلَّوْا عَنْهُمْ And then you turned away in, from your deen at that time. Meaning you wanted technology and now you're having the concerts and you're turning away from the Prophet, turning away from Mecca and Medina. This Mu'allim, meaning Rasulullah, he's just Majnoon crazy. And then Allah says, okay, fine. We will remove this punishment for a little while. So this is a little while means it's close to the day of judgment because after that is the end. وَإِنَّ كَاشِفُ الْعَذَابَ قَلِيلًا إِنَّ إِنَّكُمْ عَائِدُونَ But you are people who are going to return back to your ways. 
يَوْمَ نَبْتِشُ الْبَطْشَةَ الْكُبْرَى That day when we will grasp you with a big grasping. Meaning that's the day of judgment now. That's the big one. إِنَّا مُنْتَقِمُونَ And we will definitely take our revenge that day. So these now verses of the Qur'an, they all point to uh, the following. And that this is what I want you to tie everything into. There's going to be a global meltdown. And every city will be affected. And <clears throat> Allah is warning us in Sutul Kahf. Allah's Sunnah is also that when you reach a certain level of decadence, the punishment will come. And then this Sutul Dukhan seems to be pointing specifically to the reaction of some of the believers to when they will be filled with Dukhan, with smoke. Which in Nu'aim bin Hamad, his book of Hadith, it mentions this as had. When you hear the sound that every nation will think the nation by it got destroyed. Is this another narration? How do you think all of these ayat and this Hadith about the 99 out of 100, how do you think all this ties in from where we are standing in today? It's, I mean, especially when you read those ayahs of Quran, really is just only thing I can say is may Allah protect us and keep us amongst those that even in those difficult times we continue to do good deeds and, and turn to Him and protect the Muslim lands from falling into such kinds of fitna. Um, but the one thing that I can say is I personally would not find it totally shocking that some of these types of things that are talked about 99 out of 100 people getting killed and things of that nature could happen in the very near future um, with the way that, again, the economy is crashing, countries, nations, people are getting desperate. It is becoming their human responsibility. You can't expect anything different from them as a human. Mm. It's going to become their human responsibility to survive in whatever way they can find to survive. And if that is so contrary and in contrast to some of these other people who are in control of the kinds of weapons that can cause mass casualties to people. Um, I'll just say that it's totally logical, feasible, and perceivable that that could happen right now. Not something that I think any of us would look at and say, Oh no, that can't be talking. Could be, could not. Maybe it's talking later. Maybe it's World War to... One did happen, and World War Two right. did happen, and and uh, we've only advanced the weapons around really. the same areas again. And the weapons are only more advanced, and it, and specifically, if you when you think about it, you're now not only centralizing it to countries, you're centralizing it to a region. You're talking about Euphrates. Well pretty easy to set I'm not trying to suggest this I'm just trying to go crazy with my imagination but it's pretty easy to set up a region like that as like a a sure die zone with you know mines and whatever else military weapons they could set up where if anybody were to actually physically go try to get anything it would be a logical outcome that they would be dead right so mm. again without me trying to give my take or anything like that because i'm definitely not knowledgeable on it all i can say is the way we are currently structured we have given oil the same exact value as gold at the same time we have we now live in a system which has two very opposing, ide opposing ideologies 
as far as economics, trade, and global, you know, dealings. Yeah, I, in I general. guess one one thing is clear, right? If there's one sole supreme power, everything is smooth, even if it's unjust. Right. But when you're trying to create a polarization or a multipolar world, that is going to create conflict. Right. But it's necessary because right, right, right. The, yes, right. it's a totally different conversation to have. But this system of the petrodollar, in my perspective, a total, an entire conversation on its own, but the system of the petrodollar is was doomed when it was created hmm. it's surprising it's lasted as long as it's lasted i'm sure they are right too <laughs> and they're they're still surviving on borrowed time so it's only a matter of time before that entire system collapses so if there isn't the polar opposite to that well then yeah and if they don't lo- allow a natural multiple uh polar world which is what they should do is just relinquish the power and just let things be the way they should if they don't do that then they're just going to end up create becoming a bigger problem for the world anyway um our time is up do you have any last words just uh forgive me if i said anything wrong if i uh hurt your feelings at all anything of the nature and also uh uh, just a reminder for us that instead of hearing these things that seem eminent and frightening and using it as entertainment to just go frighten ourselves even more uh, if we use it as a means to wake ourselves up and turn back to Allah and become those people that even in the difficult times, inshallah, we're, we're doing good deeds and getting closer to Allah, then inshallah, everything else will, will pan out on its own. Yeah, I mean, definitely the purpose of this is not, uh, and that's a very good point, is not to put fear, right? I mean, what Allah has written is going to happen. You're going to die. The world's going to come to an end. But it is rather to take Ibrah, a lesson from what is happening, what will be happening. And then for us to say, well, subhanAllah, what Allah said and his prophet said is happening. And so this should also increase our iman at the same time. And the solution is, you know, fatwa, jama'ah, hijra, and if need, then struggle for the cause and to establish if yourself in a place for the right time that you can then be in Mecca uh, at that time. Okay, thank you very much. Jazakumullah.